Okay, I've got a waved phone. Can I? Um, can I? Can we make a start? So can I can ask that everyone now is is quiet. Um, and actually, I think it's really important that that's how we conduct the debate today. So that you might hear opinions that you don't agree with. Don't really want. We don't want heckling. We want it to be a respectful uh, debate. One of our key rules in college is, to, is 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 respect and respect for others. So that's important. That's the ground. That's 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 the ground rule really for the for the debate. Um, I'd like to begin by welcoming our guests from Saddleworth School. We invited all the schools, actually, in Oldham, and it's really good of you to come. I think you've had one of the longest journeys, so welcome. I'd also like to uh, thank Oldham Council. It's their idea, this, this debate, actually. So Oldham Council instigated this and have been really, really, um, I think, really, really good to work with. They've really, they've really helped us to get this set up in, in, a, in this format. And that, I'd like to uh, thank our, our three guests and introduce them to you. So I'm going to start uh, with John Hudson on the end, Councillor John Hudson, OBE, uh, a, counsel, a member of Oldham Council since 2002, and a parish councillor uh, for 43 years, as well as being a parliamentary candidate in 1995 for a ward that no longer exists, Littleborough and Saddleworth, although I believe with the new boundary changes, it is not dissimilar to, the new, to, to, to what's proposed if it ever happens. Uh, uh, next to... Uh, John uh, is a former student of Oldham Sixth Form College, Councillor Sean Fielding. Sorry, John Hudson is the leader of the Conservative group on Oldham Council. Sean Fielding is, is, um, has been a councillor since 2012, uh, former student at the Sixth Form College, Councillor for, for Failsworth West, and the leader of the Oldham Council and the Labour group. And then next to me, Councillor Howard Sykes, MBE, uh, a councillor since... 1987, and a parish councillor, and a parliamentary candidate in the 2001 general election. We hosted a debate in 2001 in which Howard participated. Howard represents Shaw, John represents Hadworth South, Sean represents Failsworth West. Okay, so that's very illustrious and very experienced uh, set of people. Howard's the leader of the Liberal Democrats group on Alden Council. So we're going to take votes in themes. The first theme uh, for the panel uh, is youth voting, and we've got three questions on youth voting, um, starting with Alistair Perry. So, Alistair, if we can get a, a, a mic to Alistair. Uh, hi. Um, do you, this doesn't cover just Oldham, but at a national uh, level. Do you think that um, a political studies GCSE could be introduced to help people make more informed votes? Okay, so that's GCSE uh, politi political studies, and how that, would, that might help to make people more active politically and, and better informed. Uh, secondly, we've got Lisa Phillips, who's on the front row, I think. Second row. Hi, I was just wondering um, what you're going to do or what you have done to encourage young people to register to vote, especially in elections, because it's a big problem within like, younger people who can vote. Okay, so that's voter registration. And Caitlin Knowles, front row. <laughs> <coughs> uh, hi, um, I was just wondering, um, how do you think that uh, the political climate of the UK would change if the voting age was reduced to 16? Okay. It's not at the moment. So that's the impact. So that's the impact of, of votes of the on the of the, on the political climate of, of the a change to the legislation that will allow young voters voters at the age of 16 or 17 to vote. John, can we start with you? Yeah, uh, could I ask the young man at the beginning? You know, I've got to that age where I don't know what I had for my tea yesterday, <laughs> so I couldn't quite hear the full question. So could I have it again? I don't want to get it wrong. Um, could a political studies GCSE be introduced yeah. to help people make more informed votes? Yeah, and it seems like a good idea, and I, I wouldn't be against it personally. But I think the only frightening thing about it is that I think people, irrespective of their age, are more likely to be able to form their own opinions now. So if they did it, I would worry about whether there would be pressure from, and I don't want to upset your lecturers or teachers or whatever you call them, but they could be undue pressure with their views to come on to you. And I would worry about that. I would rather respect your view and what you thought 
But if you think political studies would be a good thing, I wouldn't be against it, but I would caution that I would bring it in. Uh, the second question was uh, how we're we going to get younger voters to register, um, particularly with, in local elections. Well, that, that's the seventy-five million dollar question. I mean, our, if, we, if, if the three of us knew, we would be having fifty and sixty percent polls. But I think there's a lot of cynicism because. We're all talking at the moment, well, I don't know if you are, but everywhere I go, they're talking about Brexit. I'm a bit fed up with it. I, I, but um, here we are, wh whatever I thought of it, and I'm not sure it was done right, but I think here we had an exercise where the largest number ever of people recorded their vote, and then they feel divided and, and unloved by all the parties because they don't see solutions coming forward. And that's, we should learn from that. We should learn that whatever we do to improve it, there's always a chance of ruining what we have. So I think we've got to be careful and make sure. I would like personally, for people to use the vote, and like in Australia, where they have to use the vote, I'm not so sure that you should ever take away the right of people to go to the polling station and say, I don't like any of them, so I'm not voting. I think that should always be there. But I do think that if we could hit upon a solution that wouldn't be political, uh, then it would be an improvement if we could improve. But I think Oldham Council are doing everything they can to improve people to come out and vote by having people of all parties and everybody getting chances. So I think for young people, there's never been a better time for you to use when the time comes, when you're 18 and you vote. I know it's a bit contentious, this, but I thought I knew everything when I was young, and now I'm older, I realise I didn't. But I didn't think that then. So I understand the frustrations of... of saying we need to improve it. But I think it's not as easy as you think. I would turn the question around and say, what do people at colleges up and down the country think? Why do you think, what do you think we should do at all to improve the turnouts? We'd very much like, all the parties would very much like turnouts to be 60 and 70% in local elections. That would be fine. Whoever won, I've never worried about winning. That's probably because I've lost a lot of time. But you, you get used to it, you know, really. But it's a case of, it's a very difficult question and a very good question. And I think it's a question that should occupy the minds of all the politicians in Westminster. Thanks, thanks, John. And uh, the third question. Yes, that, that, that could almost be a yes or no, really. I've, would you agree that the voting age should be reduced to 16? No. Well, no, <laughs> I, obviously I, I wouldn't because of what I've said. Um, I, I mean, it's not going to be popular, but I'm going to say it. I think there are a lot of people I meet, and I dare say there are a lot in this audience, that know more at 16 than some of the people that I meet at 38 and 40. But unfortunately, when you make legislation, which is from Land's End to John O'Groats, and it has to be a blanket situation, you've got to remember in my day, I had to wait till I was 21 to vote. Now, I think it were a good thing to make it 18 because the world moves on. 
But I think where do you stop? There are also people I've met at 14 and 15 who have the ability to assimilate facts and, and have good discussions. So I think there's a problem with it. The politicians will look to what's best for them. I personally think Look at your mothers and fathers and your granny and granddads. They aren't old. They're old. They've been young, like you. And like me, they thought they knew everything. And I protested when I was 16 at everything. And I was quite radical. But as life gets on and you get responsibilities and you get different things, you change your view. So I'm going to say no, I wouldn't support 16. And that is no insult to anybody in this audience. It's my honest, balanced view that looking at it overall, I think that's the best situation to keep us at 18. Thank but I know that's not popular. But that's how I no, feel. No, no, I think that's fair enough. I'm going to, I'm going to become more, a bit more Dimbleby now and sort of cut down the length of people's <laughs> answers. But that was a very, very good answer, John. Thank you for that. Uh, Sean. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Peter. Um, and, and thank you for inviting me. I was just interviewed by the Cron up the back and uh, I was asked, um, when was the last time you were in here? And it was actually 10 years ago when I collected my A-level results. So um, it's not changed much, I've got to say. Maybe we need to... <laughs> maybe that's a consequence of the government we have not investing in educational facilities, but... Um, so the first question on political studies GCSE, um, I think it's, it's a good step um, and pe young people are often dismissed as not being, very, not being political and not being interested, but I think if anything, if we learn anything from the general election campaign last year, it's that young people have always been very political, often without realising it. Uh, the thing that frustrates me a lot when I go around and speak to people and, and they'll talk about housing and they'll talk about the cost of bus fares and then they'll say, Oh, well, we're not political. Well, these are all political issues. You know, almost everything is a political issue. Um, and I think that young people are very political, and those that have a, a <coughs> greater interest in politics, a political studies GCSE would give them the option to explore that a bit more and study it and get a qualification in it. But I don't think it's the answer to engaging more people. I think that um, when I was at school, we had citizenship classes, or it was called uh, PAL, Preparation for Adult Life. Now, I didn't feel that much of what I was taught in that was preparing me for adult life. Um, there was very little about politics um, and the way that government works, which is incredibly important. There was very little about managing your own finances, which again is incredibly important. And a lot of people run into problems with the finances because they simply don't know how to manage them and don't know how to handle them. And, and we assume that people know these things. And so I think that there needs to be a bigger role in citizenship and in whatever the equivalent of PAL is now um, to learn about how government works and the importance of local government uh, and national government and how the role is broken down. And of course, the importance of government at European level, because I think that some of the things that we've seen recently, um, is some of the results that we've seen recently have been born out of an ignorance of what um, European government actually does. Um, and so I would support political studies GCSE, but in terms of engaging more people and making people better informed, it's about putting it into citizenship and so that you catch everybody, not just those that have a particular interest. Uh, in terms of engaging uh, more young people to register to vote, uh, a lot of the time it's been left up to uh, political parties themselves, and some of them are more active in recruiting people onto the electoral register than others because they have an interest, because they're the makeup of the people that tend to vote for them. Uh, there's a differential, it's fair to say, between who votes for one party and who votes for another in the age breakdown. But I think that... Um, Local authorities like ours uh, have a, more of a role to play in getting on university and college campuses like this one. Um, and again, by tying in with citizenship uh, learning and citizenship classes and explaining the importance of being registered to vote, uh, what it actually means and what you can influence as a result of engaging in the democratic process is the most important thing that we can, that we can do. So I think that local authorities need to um, be better supported to get out there into places like this and do more things like this as well. Um, I think, uh, I don't recall an event like this taking place during local democracy week when I was here uh, between 2006 and 2008. And I think it would have been really valuable. And it would have been really valuable to invite people that don't just have an interest in studying politics. I would imagine, although, I mean, I'm happy to be corrected, that a lot of people out there are studying uh, humanities, A-levels, 
um, and genuinely, uh, generally interested in, in, in this sort of stuff. Um, when I came here, I studied maths, physics, and chemistry. Mm -hmm. So I think I probably would have been assumed that I didn't care and wouldn't have want, wanted to come to one of these. Um, and, and, and maybe it did take place and I just didn't know because of that. Uh, but like I say, I think it's for local authorities to get onto campuses and to uh, do more to get people onto the electoral register. In terms of the third question, um, the question was, how do you think the political climate would be different rather than do you support the reduction of voting age? Yeah. Um, I will talk at length, possibly, about uh, supporting the reduction of the voting age. In terms of the political climate, though, uh, we would have had a set of different results in the last few votes, I think, if 16 and 17-year-olds were allowed to vote. Um, and maybe that's why some people are uh, not supportive of that. Um, but on votes at 16 in general, in my view, the fact that people aren't allowed to vote at 16 and 17 is just a discrepancy. You can, vote, you can go to work, you pay tax, you can get married, you can join the armed forces. So you can be, you, people can take... Elected politicians can take your money off you and you can have no say in how that money is spent because you're not allowed to vote. Equally, if you join the military, you can be sent out to go and fight on behalf of the country and directed by politicians that, again, you have had no say in electing. And I think that reducing the voting age to 16 would just be an exercise in correcting that discrepancy. Thank you very much. Howard? Uh, yeah, um, not much left to say, is there really? <laughs> um, but I, I don't disagree, I think, with what Sean said about the political studies. I think if they had it, it'd be great. It'd be another GCSE option for people. But I think the people who are interested in it would end up doing it. I don't think it would necessarily contribute to the people, uh, whether you're a willing participant in this in this room or the other few hundred students that are outside will say, you really did what? Well, we did, you know, where, where have you been for the last hour? Um, so, so I, I don't think it would. I think there needs to be more discussion, more discussion at home, um, more discussion um, within educational institutions, citizenships, uh, PSE, personal, social, whatever they used to call it when I were at school ages ago, um, our, our form time, when we used to have a bit of banter with our tutor. But you used to explore sometimes some of those issues. Uh, and I think we need to put some of that in. So. And that is about citizenship, because part of this is about, it isn't just about people knowing what the system is, it's also about knowing responsibilities. It's a two-way system, whereas I think at the moment we've got into a very passive, a number of people who always say, it's somebody else's fault. And it isn't, it's all our faults, and it's where you then engage with that process. So, a good idea, if you give a good somebody a good option, but what, would, it, would, would it help? I don't think so. I think it needs to be a broader than that. Um, in terms of young people register to vote, um, I always make a point, and it's, it's, it's interesting, because um, it's actually in some young people's psyche. So on, on the occasions, and we all do it, uh, you knock on the door, and you know, occasionally you'll be extracted from in front of the Xbox or your phone and have to open the door instead of your parents. And then you open the door and you go, hang on, I'll get my mum and dad. And I always say, no, don't. I want to talk to you. Um, so, so in terms of what I do, I make a point of trying to talk to people. Because what I find, regardless of what the voting age is, unless people choose to use that vote the first year they have it, when they're 18 or the second time, they'll be the people in 20 years' time, and I've been in this game nearly 30 years, when I knock on their doors. I've never, ever voted. But I tell you what, they have loads of opinions, uh, and they're a bunch of smart, and I won't use the word, uh, whatever's, uh, in terms of what should and shouldn't be done, but they can't be bothered to find five minutes um, to go and put the cross against somebody. And, and I suppose that's partly related to that question. There is somebody in my ward, I do not know who it is, who goes and writes a very abusive set of words on a ballot paper. But they go and exercise their democratic right, and they tell me what they think of me <laughs> and my colleagues every time they've got an opportunity. And good on them, and long may it continue. <laughs> and what I always tell young people, I'd rather you go and vote for somebody else than not vote. Because I think you abdicate your responsibility then as a citizen. Uh, and in terms of political climate, well, we wouldn't be having Brexit if we had 16s uh, that could vote. Um, we'd be having a very more international focused debate, I think, um, if, if, if we had voting age at 16 in terms of some young people. But I'm not, uh, and I'd like to think they'd vote in bucketfuls, um, but I do think the vast majority of your colleagues will be in the can't be arsed club, I'm afraid, um, if you reduced it to 16, which I think is a shame, and they'd develop that 
pattern of not voting at 16 rather than 18. Oh, that was shy enough. Thank, Thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, I think what we're going to do is I'm going to ask the panel a question, a yes or no in a second. But before that, I'm going to ask you guys uh, to vote now, if you would, please. So if you get your phones out, let's hope this works. <laughs> the question is going to be, do you support lower, lowering the voting age to 16, yes, no, or unsure? So it's yes, no, or unsure. 80, 20. <laughs> Suspense. That's always the worry. <laughs> Nothing happens. Just like real life, nobody's going to call that stage. Oh, we've got to press go. Wow. Okay. So that's, uh, that's interesting. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, we have had this debate. Um, we, had, we held this debate last year and had a sort of fairly similar outcome, actually. But I'm, I just want to ask, the, the, this has got to be a yes or no to the, uh, to the three of you. Uh, would you be in favor of the, of the law changing to make it compulsory to vote, irrespective of you know, whether it's 16 or 18? Yeah? That's, that can be yes, no, or unsure. Yes. No. Yes. Excellent, thank you. That's really interesting. Great. Okay, so we're going to move. The, we're going to move on now to a uh, to a to a to a different theme altogether. It's Emily, and she's going to ask a question about mental health. Emily. Um, Seventy-five percent of sixteen to eighteen-year-olds um, in the UK with a mental health issue are currently not receiving treatment. What can you do for people like us who are being overlooked in terms of the mental health by the system? Thank you very much. I'm going to start with Sean this time. Oh, okay. 75%, um, it's a, it is a, a shocking statistic. And I, I think that the, you know, when somebody has a physical illness, it's quite obvious in most cases. And mental illness is something that can remain quite hidden. And I don't think it's something that we're alive to as a society, quite how prevalent it is, particularly among young people. I think one of the reasons for that is that uh, a lot of the challenges that have led to the mental health crisis in young people weren't present when the people that are currently responsible for making policy were younger. Um, I was thinking about this issue last night because I knew that it would come up. And, you know, there's a particular pressure on young people in relation to uh, social media uh, and body image. I think, you know, s social media itself is, was, is a relatively new phenomenon. And there's a lot of people that judge, not a lot of people, sorry. It's been reported that there are young people that um, are hard on themselves when they don't receive as many likes on Instagram or Twitter or on Facebook. And that's not something that was present when uh, the current people that are in charge of uh, deploying funding on health services or shaping health policy were around. And then, of course, you know, we have uh, programs like Love Island, which is a relatively new thing as well, which puts uh, pressure on uh, young people um, over body image and I mean I use Oldham gym and I used to go to pure gym and I, I think about some of the people that you, you see in there that seem to spend more time taking pictures of themselves in the weights machines than they actually do working out um, and I think that that's a kind of a symptom itself that people are quite insecure about their image um, and well anyway on those two issues those would have been present anyway you know we can't stop the rise of social media we can't tell the television channels what programming to set um, but one of the other issues that's led to a rise in um, insecurity among young people and, and problems with mental health is uh, cutbacks to early intervention services that local authorities are responsible for providing. So there are more young people now that grow up in insecure homes that move more times because uh, there, is not, there are not secure tenancies in terms of housing. So there's uh, families that live in insecure private rented accommodation and move lots of times, which is quite traumatic for young people. Um, and that's because it's been a failure over many years to build enough housing to provide people with um, secure housing. Um, there's been a cutback to uh, services like Sure Start. Um, there are uh, people who have children who 10, 15 years ago would have accessed services like Sure Start and how to cook, how to be a good parent and all the rest of it that would have helped them to provide a stable, loving home for their children. And those services don't exist anymore. So there are a lot of people that are left to their own devices and can't cope. 
Uh, there's greater financial insecurity um, because of the rollout of universal credit, the cuts to, cuts to benefits, um, insecurity of work, so people are on uh, zero-hours contracts, are low-paid, um, are working irregular hours, and are able to provide a stable home life for young people. And as those young people grow up, because of the trauma that they've experienced and the insecurity that they've experienced early on in their lives, they're going on and placing a significant pressure on, on services further down the line. And it is a real false economy, you know, um, not building houses, not investing in education, not providing services like Shorestart. You know, you might make a cut that day and save some money, but in 10 years' time, and all the young people that have gone through the system and had those problems turn up at the council having to access mental health services or turn up at A&E because they've been self-harming or whatever, um, it costs a damn sight more at that point than it would if you got, got on top of the problem early on. And so I suppose as leader of the council here, what we're trying to do is make sure that we make better use of the limited resources that we have left. And we're never going to be able to replace what's been taken off, taken off us. You know? So this isn't an, you know, by redesigning and being innovative, everybody loves the word innovative, we're not going to replace all the things that I've talked about. But we can do a bit better by bringing together you know, the health service, the police, the fire service, the council, so that people that are in trouble are get, have got one part of contact and are treated like human beings rather than being treated like a, a number and being churned in and out of all different services. So we're doing what we can. But the reality is we just need some more money. Thank you. Howard? Um, I think mental health is one of the untalked about things, whether it be with young people or older people. Um, and if you've got direct experience of it, you have my sympathies. Um, I, I've experienced it at the other end of the scheme with my mum who's got dementia. Um, but equally so, um, it, it's as important with young people at the other end. And, and, and you want a scurry statistic, one in five of girls under 24 have self-harmed I mean, so, so just count four along in that row and work it out, and that'll be you in this room. Um, and we need to do something about that. So, so if I approach it a different way, and I wouldn't necessarily disagree with all the stuff around early intervention, we spend money, you know, that, that Sean said, and there's no point repeating that in, in some senses. But I think there's a key issue for having people who have a clear mental health focus being based in educational institutions where the kids are, Sorry, kids, children, young people, sorry. But, um, and I, but, I, but I do think some of this is society is now paying a very heavy price for some, some of the things where um, it wasn't like it was at school. I mean, if I speak to any of the academic staff here, the bullying and other stuff that goes on on social media, and we can't disinvent it, but it just didn't used to exist. Um, certainly, the school my son goes to, it, it would speak to the staff there. Um, uh, the whole stuff about body image, um, it, it, and I can understand that as well, and I think that's right in, t in terms of the pressure that creates on people. But then also people tend to have different sort of friendship groups, which tend to be wider, and it's superficial, my experience. Um, uh, and if some of you have got good mates, um, stick with them. I, I'm still got a set of friends I had from secondary school who I could pick up the phone and talk to. I'm just conscious a lot of young people don't have that. Um, so some of it is about family background, but some of it can come from some quite wealthy, stable backgrounds and still have uh, uh, mental health issues. So who do you go and talk to it about? Do you go and talk to the member of staff who's responsible for it, who also teaches two other subjects and is responsible for under of you? So, there's a resource issue about that, and because it's hidden, um, but we are starting to talk about it, so, you know, it's a good question. Um, CAMS, I think it's called, it's Children and Adults Mental Health Services, um, we need to do that better. We are not good at doing that in Oldham, um, regardless of the resources, uh, and the Council in Furness has wised up to that with our partners in the NHS, and we're trying to do something about it. We can always do more, it's about making sure we do what we've got, but it's also about creating that environment so people can talk about this. And, and if, from what you said in your question, you are very brave to ask that question, so well done, because mm. um, um, you talked about I when you asked the question. Um, and carry on talking to people, and as bad as you think it is, you'll come out of it, and you'll be able to talk about it, and then hopefully you'll be able to help other people as well. Because if you ever have suffered from this, I would always say to people, and it goes back to that voting and active citizenship, think what it was like when you were in that bad place and find some time to help other people get out of it. And that's how we'll crack that problem, in my opinion.
Thank you, Howard. John. Well, I think it's a good question, especially for the people from Saddleworth. I have a friend whose daughter recently was in a terrible situation and went on the railway line. So I know how bad it is. But you've got to remember, you can't ask politicians to put everything right. We're in the 21st century, and it's no use going back like the Pope gets off the plane and kisses the ground and says, we're sorry for what happened 200 years ago. Of course we are, but that doesn't mean we can put it instantly right. We can't, because years ago, you won't believe this, but your mothers and fathers and grannies and granddad had things like mental health, but they were called nervous breakdowns. It was different in those days. People didn't accept it. You had to get on with it and do it. I don't think that's right, and I think we should be paying more attention to it. But I don't think it's just politicians. I think it's people and people's attitudes in the 21st century towards this. It's very difficult. I know that girl's parents so well. They were young to me. And I know how many people wanted to approach them, but they didn't. And you can't pretend these things don't happen. You've got to... It isn't a magic broom that politicians can wave the magic wand and change. It isn't. It's a very good question, and it's a question that will haunt everybody. We've all got to have the input to be better at understanding our neighbours and our people and our daughters and granddaughters and grandsons and sons. We've all got to realise that it's our input, not just the politician. Hey, I'd have a breakdown now if I listened to these two all the time, but I, I ignore them sometimes. I go to Oldham and I've been one out of 60, but I've never let that bother me. Even when I had cancer, I got right and come back because I like it. And why should they prevent me from doing a saying what I think's right? And that's what I think about young people. They've got to make sure that the climate is right and they treat their colleagues right. And it works up from that. Parents have to treat the children and the grandchildren different. We're in a different age, and there's different pressures. I don't blame social media, although I know Sean knows from when I was the mayor. I weren't a lover of social media, particularly in the council chamber, when the mind should be on other things. And I wouldn't be a lover if I were your teacher, if you were on the computers when I were teaching you. I'd have to tell you about it. But that's my view. John, just, we just, can we, and, we've got and, six and more so questions. And so I'm saying to you, I think it's minutes. a good <laughs> question. <laughs> but you. I think it comes back to you and your age group. You've got to learn from this and make sure that things are better. Thank you. OK, now we are going to have another vote. Uh, you'll be hopefully pleased to hear. Uh, <laughs> the question is, do you think there needs to be an improvement in mental health service for young people in older? And so off you go. <laughs> Hoping that uh, that was straightforward. Uh, Ninety-five, must be. <laughs> I'd be amazed if they uh, didn't. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> What's the matter? There you go. <laughs> right. Okay. So don't put your phones away because we're actually going to do the next question. We're going to flip it and we're going to ask for your opinions before we move on to the uh, the question. Um, the question uh, that we want you to answer is, what do you think is the biggest cause of homelessness? Okay, so, a bit of thinking now. Howard's going to uh, take the first, the question, which is from 
Amaria. Where's Amaria? Oh, yeah, brilliant. Just give us, one, give us one more minute. <laughs> Capitalism. Okay. <laughs> so we have a wordle. Amaria, your question. Can you all be quiet, please, guys? What, what are the proposed solutions for the increased number of rough sleepers in Oldham and Greater Manchester? Thank you. Howard. Um, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, if you were asking me what's the biggest single issue facing the nation, if you put environment and Brexit on one side, it would be housing and the lack of it. Um, we need to build something like 300,000 homes a year. We are pitifully way short of that, building 50 or 60,000 in a good year. Um, I, I, and in fairness, recently, um, at long last, local authorities have been allowed to start building some houses, so hopefully we'll start to do some of that as well. So to answer your question in a, in a, in a sort of systematic way, first of all, there are not enough houses for people to live in and there are not enough houses of adequate standard. So as the family unit has changed over time, so there's more single people, people live in smaller units, not in extended families, um, and whatever, the number of dwellings haven't kept pace with that, and that's why you'll find some people um, live in very crowded accommodation, or accommodation isn't what they would aspire to. Um, whatever that might be, and that one, but I mean that is, you know, there'll be three or four kids in a bedroom rather than a bedroom each, um, depending on what age they are and things like that. So, um, housing supply is the other issue. The other issue is when you talk about rough sleepers, um, can be a whole catalogue of problem. And if you ever go and talk to some, and some will talk to you, uh, and some won't, and you need to be careful because some of these are people who are, and it comes back to your point really not well um, and that's one of the reasons they're on the street and they haven't necessarily either access services uh, in terms of mental health and just can't cope and therefore end up in a spiral and once you get in that spiral uh, no address no job no benefits it's very easy to end up on the street if you've got no immediate family to support you and lean on and you've got uh, uh, no cushion um, financial or otherwise to lean on. So some people have, you know, due to a set of circumstances, you know, maybe split up from a partner, become unwell, lose the job and whatever, if you actually speak to them, get into that spiral uh, and, and end up there. So uh, in fairness, and he's doing a good job, and I'd say, I'd say it on this issue, in terms of doing something about it, uh, the mayor has made it a bit of a priority in Greater Manchester and is trying to do something. Um, I'm not convinced the answer is putting 100 of them to live in Oldham when he takes North of Street in Manchester, which is what he's done. But they're in houses, so that's better. Um, so I think there's a whole set of things about asking people, but the biggest single way of stopping people being homeless is to make them purposeful. And for most people, that's having gainful employment. If people have gainful employment, they have got an opportunity, even with the housing shortage we've got, to get some sort of accommodation if they're physically and mentally well enough. If they haven't got a job, and then they end up homeless, how do you get out of that spiral? Uh, and, and, and the answer is, you don't. And there is a set of people that live like that. There's another set of people that, and, and you, you might have friends who do it, who what they call sofa surfing. So they'll spend a couple of nights or a couple of weeks at a mate's till they get fed up, and then they'll get moved on and sent somewhere else. They've got no fixed aboard. So just imagine if you've got that, how are you supposed to do any sort of academic studies? How are you supposed to focus on anything? Wherever you are on that spectrum, whether you're here or you're at the FE College or whatever, uh, and that's why. So, so housing supply, to answer your question, we need more homes. That's to buy, rent, share, uh, all models, all sizes, all shapes, and people being purposeful in terms of having a job and sufficient income in order to be able to look after themselves and the third point comes back to the lady's point in the front here, appropriate mental health services, because a lot of these people are uh, either mentally unwell or have severe addiction problems to either drugs or alcohol. We're going to try and uh, get through all of our questions and finish at about two-ish, so I'm going to just run, overrun a little bit. Uh, so I'm going to ask for, for brevity, please, guys, with short, short answers all the way. John. 
Right, well, quick answer is I agree with Howard about the housing, but everybody wants, when I go to planning, it's not in my backyard. Everybody says, all the parties say, we need more housing, but when it comes to it, they don't want them next to them. I think the mayor, the elected mayor of Manchester is quite right to put this issue. Whether he's successful or not, I hope he is, but I think it's more than rhetoric that is required. I think it's to look after these people and put their needs first. And I think we all have a part to play. How many of us walk past them and don't help or ask them? Howard says some people don't want to speak to you because they're sick. Well, they might be, but they do want you to be concerned and they do feel that they like all of us. They want people to know that we're interested in them. So we mustn't pass on the other side. We must all be good Samaritans and help the mayor to solve this problem. Thanks, John. Sure. All right, uh, thanks. Um, I just want to say, whoever voted for capitalism, well done, because uh, that's what I would have voted for. But I don't think we're going to solve uh, economic systems uh, this afternoon here. Um, I do want to highlight the distinction that Howard made between homelessness and rough sleeping. Uh, they are two very different things. Mm. It is um, important. There is a lot of hidden homelessness. There's a lot of people that do sofa surf and couch surf. And one of the issues that we've had in... Um, one, of, one of the problems that's led to that is that for a long time we were told that people didn't want, you know, one-bedroom flats. So Primrose Bank, if you come in on the 184 or the 409 from Ashton and you pass those new houses on the left, those are new family houses that replaced a lot of, you know, one, two-bedroom flats. And we were told for a long time that that's not what people wanted. They wanted family housing. So that was built. But, of course, when there was the change of government back in 2010, they introduced the uh, bedroom tax. So people that are eligible for um, one-bedroom flats, there's not enough of a supply. Um, I went out with Street Angels, which are the people that walk around in the big orange coats around Yorkshire Street and Union Street on a Saturday night, you know, picking people up when they've had a bit too much to drink. And they also look after some of the homeless at the, their centre on Rock Street. And speaking to some of those homeless people in there, um, the first thing they say, well, a lot of them are single men. Um, and a lot of them are men uh, that have ended up on the streets as a result of family breakdown. So they've fallen out with a partner, uh, they've been thrown out of the house and they've had nowhere else to go because they've not had a support network in terms of family or friends and they've ended up on the street. And one thing that was really interesting about what they said as well is, I don't want a flat because if you give me a flat, I won't be able to pay the rent, I won't be able to pay the bills because I just can't cope. I need to get myself straight. And there was one guy that told a story about how he, he climbed up Indian's head and went and lived in a cave for three weeks to get himself clean because he said he wouldn't have been able to cope uh, you know, in the way that you, not, uh, mo most people do um, by you know, paying your rent and paying your bills and living in a house in the, in the traditional way. And it is something of a spiral because when those people end up out on the streets, it's difficult to get out of that. Um, if people have seen the film the, the Shawshank Redemption, the guy that's been in prison for decades and then he ultimately gets released and when he gets released, he, he kills himself because he can't cope with having a job and he can't cope with having a flat uh, because he's become institutionalised and he's become uh, used to being locked up and having everything uh, sorted for him. And it's the same with a lot of our homeless people. A lot of our homeless people, it's too big a step to give them flats. Now, one thing that the mayor is doing is um, promising a bed every night uh, over Christmas. At the moment, uh, the legislation only says that you have to provide a bed for somebody who's rough sleeping if the temperature drops below zero three nights in a row. So it has to be below freezing for three nights before you even offer somebody a bed. Now, in Greater Manchester, what the mayor's doing is saying that over Christmas this year, we'll do it every night. From the first night that's below zero, we'll do it. And I think that that's the right thing to do. But it's just a... That's... Um, it's not an issue that's going to be able, we're going to be able to solve quickly because we've been building too few and the wrong kind of properties for a long time. And the prevalence, again, of insecure work, uh, a, a, an insecure economy, is what's leading to... These are symptoms of, of a wider problem. Thank you very much. Okay. okay. So, phone's out again because we're going to move on to another, another topic, which is emergency services. And we're going to ask you to rate uh, your local emergency services... And then we're going to have a question from Matthew Gol uh, Gol Godelman. Matthew's up there, isn't he? 
be as quick as we can, if, uh, guys, just so we can get through everything um, as much as we can. How do you intend on improving um, emergency service response times and more specifically policing in the local area? Just have a look at the results there on the back behind us. It's quite interesting. So Matthew's question. Do you want to ask it again, Matthew? Take two. Um, <laughs> How do you intend on improving the um, emergency service response time and policing in the local area? I'm going to start with John. I mean, they what? Yeah, the question was, how do you intend on improving emergency service response time in the local area? Well, it's very difficult. I, I think figures can be made to say anything. And I think <coughs> all political parties are guilty of using the figures for their own ends. I think what we need to do is look at what is really happening in the real world, not the Westminster bubble, and make sure that we apply our money and time to the real emergency services that are required. See, what you might call emergency won't happen if... I had an emergency when I had cancer and I thought I was going to die. That, to me, was an emergency. But yet they had to prioritise me because there are people worse than me. You don't think that at the time. When you are ill and you require emergency services, you prioritise yourself as being up here. But sometimes those people, doctors, nurses, ambulance drivers, firemen, older people, they have to prioritise everything, and it's very difficult. So it needs to be an impassioned view, and we need to look at it properly without bringing the politics into it, because this is something that's very important to everybody, and we do need real emergency services to improve. So I think it won't improve with any political input. <laughs> it's better without it. Thank you, John. Uh, Sean. Right. Um, I, I, I don't think I can let this don't bring the politics into it go. I remember when I was at um, university and there were some elections being run for the students' union and somebody came in and spoke at the front of the lecture theatre and said, let's leave politics out of the students' union, let's just get somebody in there who cares. You know, but if you have different views, you care about different things, everything is a political issue, and you can't leave politics out of the issue of policing when you've got one party that's cut 2,000 police from the streets of Greater Manchester over eight years and intends to continue cutting them, and you've got another party that's saying we should recruit 10,000. It is very much a political issue. In terms of response times, you know... Uh, it is, you know, John was right about priority. If you ring up and you say, you know, someone's got a knife tonight, a, a knife, and they're coming to attack me, then the police are probably going to turn up pretty quick. Whereas if you ring up and you say, oh, I was burgled last night and my bike's missing, then they're probably going to leave it. And unfortunately, in many cases, because of how few police there are on the streets now, that results in you getting a text two weeks later saying, we're not actually bothering to, uh, we're not actually bothering to investigate who's nicked your bike. Sorry. And I've had cases where that's happened. But it is very much a political issue. And on, I mean, the question that I was briefed on and, and that Peter read out was about emergency services in general. It's not just the police that have been caught. There are 7,000 fewer fire, um, firefighters on the streets of Greater Man uh, working in Greater Manchester than there were eight years ago. Um, and it's just shocking. So if you want to, re if, if you want to improve resp police response times, there needs to be more of them. Um, and that is very much a political issue because you've got one set of politicians saying we need more and we'll recruit more, and one who is saying, no, you're doing all right. And, and shockingly, and uh, shockingly, somebody in, uh, who was a councillor in Greater Manchester was in the paper the other day saying, oh, the police just need to be more efficient. You know, and and he, it, his basis for his, fa uh, his statement was that he used to be a civilian officer within Greater Manchester Police. Well, you know what? I used to fill shelves at Tesco. But when they were in trouble six years ago, I wasn't ringing them up and saying, oh, you need to listen to me because I know what's best for you. Okay. Howard. <laughs> Good. Oh. It's taking a while, but we're getting going, aren't we? <laughs> right, right, right. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. Um, I, I think the other bit, not wishing to, to whatever, but it is a political issue. I think the other bit you need to recognise is in terms of per head of population, we get a really bad deal in Greater Manchester mm. compared to other forces. So... Because we don't have a, a national police force, and I'm not somebody who's in favour of one either, 
but we get a bad deal. So actually, in terms of heads of population, the num number of people who live here, we have less, and I'd always have had, even when we had the extra 2,000 police, we no longer have um, uh, uh, to, to, to help. So, so I think that's, that's part of the problem about, it's the unfairness of it. And that's the balance about, well, why, why is that and whatever, and you know, MPs set the conditions um, for stuff like that. But, but there's things we can do. There are things the police can do, and, and sometimes um, uh, that doesn't mean they shouldn't change. And, and, and depending, you might well have them come in and talk to you. Um, my experience, I could say, is um, they've been very good at telling you how much money they haven't got and what they can't do. Um, my experience is they're less good at saying, but we need to make the best job we can with what we've got. Whereas I think us in local government are actually very good at that. It's one of the reasons the government keeps cutting us, because we keep delivering, whereas the yeah. health service doesn't, for example. Um, so you can improve response time. I mean, in some senses, firefighters, yeah, there is a lot less firefighters uh, and emergency rescue services, but there's actually a lot less fires. They've been that successful. There's not less crime, though, is there? There is not less crime, and, and the role of firefighters is changing. So they're now looking at, in some places, they do the when people fall over rather than the ambulance service, you combine it together. I think that's the way we need to move on from emergency services. Uh, but I worry about the police. It feels like it did right at the start of my elected career, if you call it that, um, where the police were quite distant, uh, not necessarily well regarded or well respected due to the fact that they seem not to care about that low level stuff that might be your bike, it might be your phone, it might be somebody that's had a pop at you in spindles you report it and they don't do anything. And I, I, I get worried that, that we need to not get in that space where we need to respect our uh, police force and the work they do uh, uh, and, and the way they need to look after our communities. Otherwise, we're down a very slippery slope. So simple answer is we need more of them, but I think sometimes they need to work a little bit different than they maybe they traditionally have in the past in terms of the coppers. Thank you, Ard. Have we got time for two more questions, or do you guys need to get off your or guests? Have you got time for two, oh, take two I more? Have, yeah, yeah. You, okay, great. Yeah. That's perfect. Thank you very much. So, Long um, worse things than well, this I've got, we, we, have, we, have, we, have, we have more <laughs> questions than, than time, but I'm going to take two more questions. The first one, I'm going to just move things about a little bit, is a public transport question. We're going to skip the vote just to speed things up, and I'm going to just choose one of the three questions that we've got, because they're similar. That's for Hana, Akhtar, and Sadia Begum. It's their question. Sorry, I was going to that. Sorry, Joe. Hands up. Yeah, okay, that's perfect. Yeah, yeah. Le Leandro, your question. Hello. Hi, <laughs> uh, I was just wondering if you agreed with me that um, public transport should be subsidised for all full time students. And starting, sorry, with Sean. Okay. Public transport is what? Should public transport be subsidised for full-time students? So, uh, should yeah. it be, are you asking if it should be free for you guys here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't think so. But that, that, okay. that, <laughs> and I'll tell you for why. Because it's okay. you might think that now, but when you're 26 with a family and you're paying your rates, you won't want to pay for those 16-year-olds to go free. And so, you'll change your mind. And it's a matter of looking at it objectively and saying what is necessary. Yeah, public <coughs> transport. I think great strides have been made in public transport, and I applaud, and a lot of people do not them, Greater Manchester Transport, but I do stand up and say, when you look at the trams and you look at the different things, they have improved. I remember a time, and if you lived in Saddleworth, it takes me longer to get home when I come on the bus, on the train from London to Manchester. It takes me longer to get home to Greenfield than it did to come from London to Manchester. So all this HS2 business, it needs to be focused on local transport, getting to the city in the first place. City to city is all right, but you need local transport. And I think it they're doing a good job in Manchester and that's unusual for me to say because there aren't many Conservatives 
in Manchester, on the Greater Manchester Transport. But I don't care yeah. about that. The politics don't matter. If they go in the right way, we should all applaud that and we should say. But as far as being free, I don't think any party can afford it. It's where the money's going to come from. And you have to prioritise your money. And I don't think, with respect to you lot, who look quite good, I don't think you're a number one priority for free transport. Thank you, John. <laughs> Sean. Um, well, I've, I've just come from a meeting this morning at, at Greater Manchester where we were discussing how to fund the free bus travel for 16 to 18-year-olds. That's only bus travel. It doesn't include tram and train. Um, and so I do support that. Um, I think that for, uh, my role on the combined authority is um, the lead member in Greater Manchester for Education and Skills. And uh, travel is a barrier for some people, um, particularly at the college over the road, uh, and particularly in accessing courses that you want to do. You know, there's a lot of young people out there that go to the college that's nearest because they can get there because it doesn't cost a lot, rather than going to the college that does the course that they want. And so I do support intro in the introduction of, of, of that free bus pass. And I would look again at um, wider free travel if it can be funded. But on public transport in general, if I can just use the opportunity to talk about it, um, I think that we are incredibly poorly served, not just in Greater Manchester, but in the north of Greater Manchester. First Bus is an appalling bus company. It is, it is absolute, you know, I, I use it to go, I went into town this morning, uh, I waited for 15 minutes, three came at the same time. It's more expensive than it is in London, and that's because we've got um, a deregulated system. In London, uh, the Mayor and the Greater London Authority says what the fare is going to be, how often buses must run, which routes must run. We don't have that power in Greater Manchester. It was taken off us in the 80s. Uh, it was taken off everywhere outside London. And there's a lot of you know, MPs that don't realise quite how bad public transport is outside of London because they don't use it, because they don't venture outside of London. And some of them come up here to, to come to meetings of Greater Manchester and they'll catch, they'll overwhelmingly they catch a tram if it's on a tram route. But on the rare occasion that they have to go to Wigan or to Bolton and they have to catch a train or a bus, more often than not, the first thing that they say is, oh my God, it's terrible here, isn't it? It's really bad. And you know, and there's stuff on the, in the MEN the other week about air quality as well and about how air quality in Greater Manchester is poor because more people use the cars because they don't have confidence in public transport. And the bus that I caught this morning was a 05 plate, 13 years old, older than my car. And one of the key things that, um, one of the, the key problems that's causing poor air quality in Greater Manchester is the age of the bus fleet. On Oldham Road down towards Manchester from Oldham, air quality is poorer than some parts of Greater London. And the reason it's poorer is because our buses don't have to be bought. Uh, we don't have to buy new buses every three years like they do in, in Greater London. Uh, <laughs> I can carry it. Last thing, I promise. Again, uh, you know, I, I've been to London more times since I got this job four months ago than I had in the rest of my life combined. And I, have, um, I never opened an Oyster card account. I got out my contactless debit card. And I just tapped it on and, you know, tapped when I got off the tube. I used it on the bus. It's a flat fare on the bus in London, £1.50, I think it is, or it's not very much. And you don't even have to think about getting a change or anything. And, you, and it doesn't matter which company's operating your bus, it's the same fare, and you can change between different modes of travel. And you can't do that here. You know, it's £4.50 for a day, and you can only use that on the um, first buses. Uh, so if you want to go down to Charlton, which sadly is where a lot of my friends that I used to live uh, that used to live in Oldham, where they live now, you have to catch another operator, and it costs you six pound or whatever it is. So public transport needs to improve. I support free travel, but at the same time, there's no point in giving free travel on a network that's rubbish. Thank you very much, right. Howard. Um, well, everybody would like free public transport, including me. The question is, you've got to pay for it. So, so I'll reverse the question. The question we should be asked to asking is, we've got into a space in this country where we do not pay enough tax, be it local or national, to pay for the public services we expect. Mm. And you need to have an honest debate to say people need to pay more national insurance, more income tax, and other taxes that don't penalise the most poor like that um, to do that. And then we can have the debate you want to have. I personally have a view that when you give people things free, they don't value it if they don't make a contribution towards it. I make an exception for that for people who need to use public transport to get to educational institutions. I think that's very different than making public transport free for young people. Um, um, and, and, and it doesn't matter whether it's free or whether we charge for it. If there's no bus, there's no bus. 
Um, and the issue is, uh, and, I, and, I, and I agree with Sean here, uh, and I sit on transport for Greater Manchester uh, 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 in, in terms of that, and I bring it up in terms of the, what, what is the dire performance of our bus operator, which is dearer than the other bus operator in the south of the conurbation, which is Stagecoach. But, you know, I don't think I can quite get away with it. 1986 is when they deregulated the bus networks, and that's when we've had the shambles since it. But can we just say, Sean, I'm not being funny, your colleagues had 13 years in government to put that wrong right and never did. So you can't quite sit there and chuck rocks at John's lot because they have deregulated the buses when you've had 13 years to give us the same quality public transport they have in London. And I a simple message for me, if it's good enough for London, it's good enough for us here in Oldham and Greater Manchester and we shouldn't keep accepting second best. And we need to get angry and let people know about it. Okay, um, I'm, I'm actually going to abuse my position as chair and ask the final question myself, uh, if you don't mind. I'm going to go slightly off script, but it's just something that's very mm. contemporary, and I think it's, it's very important. It to me, it feels very important as a, as a, as a resident of Oldham myself. Um, and actually, I don't think it's just happening in Oldham, because I saw a tweet from a, a, it was Tim Farron, actually, that tweeted about his constituency, which I think is Westmoreland or somewhere like that in the north east. Um, I believe the Oldham uh, post office is being moved uh, to, well, there's a proposal for it to move to uh, Smith's news agents. Should, should we be doing something about that? And if so, what? And I'm going to start with Howard. Um, good question. Um, and I don't think this is one of those easy ones. Everybody has wants a post office, but I just asked the question, when was the last time just stick your hand up if you step foot in a post office in the last 12 months in this room. To do what? Exchange? Foreign exchange? Post? That's, that, that's good. Um, so I hope it was your local post office and you need to keep doing it. But it, it's, it's exactly the same. So, so you can have a rational argument, can't you? Um, I think what's important to us all is that we have post office services. So I, I, I actually think your question was lost 20 years ago when post offices started going in, in different places. I've lost all the post offices in the areas I represent, apart from the one in the main town, which is now the only, post the only place where you can transact, because I'm about to lose my last bank uh, in terms of a community uh, that served at the, a town centre in terms of Sean Crompton that serves over 20,000 people. Uh, and you have to say that's a bit of an outrage, isn't it? Um, but part of that is the use of the internet, Part of that is now people don't go to the post office to pick up benefits, they get it paid electronically. Uh, we've systematically starved the post office of a revenue stream. So, you know, I don't go in the post office to tax my car anymore. I do it online. I presume most people do. So some of that's cause and effect. What we need to do is maintain those post office services people may. And I have to say, if that means we put them in Smiths and that keeps that service, that's better than having a shut post office if the only way the business model works. Um, and that's a, an honest answer, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Yeah. So it's John, uh, uh, and, and then well, finally... Well, post offices, Sean. like all the retail trade, you want them, the shops, to go around on a Saturday, but you're all buying online from Amazon. So how can, to unless it. the tills click over, they can't employ people and they can't keep open just for you to go a weekend. And the post office are the same. Smiths have the post office in Ashton, and I haven't seen much difference. I've gone in and bought my stamps, and I've gone in and bought whatever I were buying, and they've been <coughs> the same staff as uh, at the Ashton post office. So we'll better wait and see. If people use it, it's like your legs. If you don't use it, you lose it. So the best thing is to keep active and use them. And I tell you, you might laugh at 16, but when you get to 70 odd, you won't laugh because you'll realize that that's right. And it, it, the post office is the same as your legs. If you don't use it, you'll lose it. So it's up to you. Thanks for that, John. <clears throat> I might use that quote myself, actually. <laughs> uh, Sean, 
Finish it off for us, yeah. please. I think that the fundamental question for me about post offices or, or, or public services in general is what do you class as a public service and what should be run as a business? And the post office for me is a key public service that is socially necessary for so many people, including elderly and vulnerable people. And the post office can be viable because all these things that people buy on Amazon and ASOS, the last time I was in the post office last week was returning an ASOS package. So I go in there quite a lot. And sometimes you have to get recorded delivery for different things. So there is still a viable use for it. But again, if we value it as a public service, then we have to accept that we have to pay for it. Mm. Um, and I think personally that the post office is something that is worth paying for. Now, the implications for the post office moving into WH Smith, because they want to run it more as a business rather than run it as um, a public service, is not just that it shifts, is not just that the service might not be as great, but it also means that the people that currently work in the post office, if they can't be tupid across on the same terms and conditions, then the people that will be manning the stands, as they do in Ashton, will be on less money with lower terms and conditions, probably the same terms and conditions as those people that currently work for WH Smith. And as people retire... Um, the, all of the people that will work in the post office will be people on low pay, part-time contracts, and insecure contracts. And for me, the post office is very much a public service. And it also is something that people come into Oldham for, and we don't have enough things in Oldham that people consciously make a trip for uh, mm, to come into our town centre. And so I do think that we should do everything we can to defend it and prevent it from Another becoming a, a privatised uh, franchise within a business that doesn't have a reputation for paying its staff and treating them that well. Thank you very much. Okay, right, so, first of all, um, I'd like to thank you as an audience for being incredibly, res incredibly respectful, actually. You've been superb. Well done. Um, I would like to thank uh, Rosie, who's our Essential Life Skills Coordinator, who's up there, and... Uh, I'm not sure, Liz, our marketing manager, and also Claire, who's our head of politics, who's done a great job organising this issue. And um, I think, actually, I think this has been a really, really interesting debate. I've really enjoyed it, actually. I think I've got to say thank you very much to all three of our, our guests today who've done a superb job in giving us a really interesting discussion and debate, and it's something I would like to do again soon. So thank you very much. Get to your lessons. <laughs>